We associate Plymouth with the Navy, but our tale in 1920 involves an army serviceman coming to visit his sweetheart in the same city. Cyril Saunders was a 21-year-old Lance Corporal in the Royal Engineers, based in Crowborough in Surrey. The source of his affection was a 16-year-old cousin called Dorothy Mary Saunders. She lived with another cousin, Mrs Elizabeth Lawrence, who owned what we call nowadays a convenience store. Her parents had died, thus the move to Plymouth. He was a popular soldier in the regiment and had even seen active service in Russia. But on the 24th of July 1920, all this was to change, and not for the better. He was accidentally struck on his head on the parade ground, which completely changed his personality. After spending ten days in hospital, he turned from a cheerful squaddy into a man who was ill-tempered and had a blank expression on his face. At one point, he heard a dog growling and had to be calmed by a fellow soldier that it did not imply immediate death. You do not have to be trained in psychology to note that he had changed. These two star-struck lovers had a growing problem as Dorothy announced that she was pregnant. Normally the poor sap would do the decent thing and marry the little minx, but Cyril had changed from an easy-going fellow into an ill-tempered obsessive following the accident. The situation was not helped by Dorothy's refusal to be a good girl and marry the ill-tempered one. Unfortunately, Cyril had become dangerously manic and claimed that someone else was the real father and would kill himself. This obviously upset Dorothy, who refused to marry Cyril and announced that the relationship was over. He returned to Surrey and brooded over the matter and wrote a series of letters in which he still claimed there was still another man who was the real father. This upset Dorothy, who did not like being a girl of easy virtue, and reiterated the end of the relationship. On the 22nd of September, Cyril took the train to Plymouth and a taxi to Mrs Lawrence's house and shop at Percy Terrace. Over to you, James, to cover the tragic event. On his arrival at Percy Terrace, he confronted Dorothy whilst Mrs Lawrence attended to a client. He then claimed that he would kill himself which naturally upset Dorothy. She asked Mrs Lawrence to return to the kitchen and calm down Cyril, who was crying at this stage. Peace broke out, and the couple later went to the cinema that evening. On their return, Dorothy reported to Mrs Lawrence that Cyril had been very tiresome and suicidal. Later in the evening, Mrs Lawrence actually turned off the gas at the mains. For modern listeners, this would appear irrelevant. The gas in those days was derived from coal and was toxic if breathed in a confined space. Hence the number of suicides by people popping their heads in the oven. Nowadays, you get a headache if you tried it. Nevertheless, a spark could blow the whole house up. The next morning, after Cyril had breakfast, he went out for a walk alone. Dorothy also went for a walk, well away from her former lover. During his lonely sojourn, Cyril tried to buy a revolver, but only managed to purchase a hunting knife. Perhaps of more importance, he bought a few drinks in a local pub. Never a good idea if one is sad and dejected. At 1pm he returned for lunch. Dorothy was not there, but he begged Mrs Lawrence that he would return to camp on the 2.15 train and never contact her again provided he saw her one more time. Eventually, Mrs. Loris relented and brought Dorothy back to Percy Terrace while she went and served in the shop. Suddenly, she heard some commotion and a cry from Dorothy. She rushed back into the kitchen and saw Dorothy clutching her throat with blood dripping from her mouth. Mrs. Lawrence threw the shop scales at Cyril and ran into the street shouting, Murder! Another soldier who was passing by heard her cries and approached Cyril, who calmly admitted his actions. He persuaded him to return inside, whilst the police were called. At the police station, Cyril made a full confession, and the scene was now set for his trial at Exeter Assizes. Now, murder has two main themes. Firstly, there is actus reus which means the actual behaviour of the killer 
that causes the death of the victim. Imagine that you were driving home and observing the highway code. A person runs in front of you and you kill them. Are you a killer? Technically, yes. Therefore, there has to be a second element. Otherwise, train drivers would be charged with murder on a regular basis. This leads to the second element, which is mens rea. In English, this means the guilty mind, and there has to be malice of forethought by the culprit. Therefore, a man innocently driving home does not have mens rea, but if the driver deliberately mounts the pavement to kill a pedestrian, he shows both actus reus and mens rea. Let us return to Cyril Saunders. There can be no doubt as to his actions. Slitting your sweetheart's throat would certainly count as actus reus, but did he do it deliberately? Given that there was no question of actus reus, his defence depended on mens rea. It is assumed that all people are saying at the time of committing murder. However, the only defence was insanity. This is known as the McNaughton Rules and arose in a case in 1843 in which the murderer was going to kill the then Prime Minister Robert Peel and killed Edward Drummond in error. Robert Peel is still remembered for the repeal of the Corn Laws and the creation of the modern police force. Stanley Percival still remains the only British Prime Minister to be assassinated. The normal method of proof is on the prosecution to prove their case. Under the McNaughton rules, it is on the defence to prove insanity, not the prosecution. Witnesses, including expert ones, can be called. Let's now look at the witnesses called to give evidence. Cyril got a good reference from his chums in the army. That was to be expected. They all agreed that the accident on the parade ground had altered his personality. His father reiterated the same stance, but unsurprisingly, Cyril Saunders became emotional on hearing his father's evidence. The problem lay with the expert witnesses. Basically, they must all agree on the same theme. If they cannot agree, then why should the jury accept the evidence of either side? And so it was to prove on this occasion. Dr Pinker of Plymouth Jail examined the accused and was asked to give his opinion. He stated that Cyril was sane at all times. In cross-examination, he admitted that the previous accident could cause Cyril to be irrational when confronted with stress. A Dr Turner, who ran a private lunatic asylum in Plimpton, near Plymouth, was asked to give his opinion. He obviously had many years of experience of dealing with the Cyril Saunders of this world, and stated that the blow on the head, coupled with the end of the affair, could have tipped him over the edge. He did admit that a superficial blow to the head would not suffice for a motion of insanity. Pretty weak, as it seemed to be a case of you pays your money and you takes your choice. The jury took only ten minutes to start the process of the trip to the gallows. This was not a case of justice delayed is no justice. On the 30th November, Cyril Saunders was executed. So John, this is right up your street. Give us your viewpoint. Despite a large petition to reduce the sentence to life imprisonment, the Home Secretary announced to the infamous Horatio Bottomley in the House of Commons that the judicial killing must proceed. Horatio Bottomley was the 1910s and 1920s answer to Robert Maxwell. He owned a very popular newspaper called John Bull and was soon to be ejected again from the House of Commons for bankruptcy. Horatio Bottomley used a motion of adjournment to ask for a medical expert to be appointed to examine the condemned man. The Home Secretary refused and said that it was pointless. The Speaker intervened and said that a motion of adjournment could not interfere in the ordinary administration of justice. The other MPs did not mention the matter and the next subject on the House of Commons agenda was pay of the Bekawano Land Police. Edward Short was the Home Secretary at the time and could not be considered 
a complete brute as he pardoned a murderer on the grounds of insanity. But his entry was horrendous as he had to cope with major industrial disputes including two police strikes on his early days in the office. In addition, there was the rise of communism, civil war in Ireland and the demobilisation of over a million men after the Great War. One wonders the amount of time he spent on some obscure Lance Corporal when examining murders in the West Country, it is extraordinary at the number of cases where the murderer is either going to kill himself or enter into a suicide pack. Yet he never undertakes this task but kills the victim. As Dr Johnson said, the expectation of the rope encourages one enormously. As observers of murders will know, this type would be classified as a crime of passion. The most famous being that of Ruth Ellis. But the British system does not recognise this and the only defence was insanity. Also, psychology was still at its early stage and the pioneers such as Sigmund Freud or Carl Gustav Jung were still practising it. The jury only deliberated on his fate for ten minutes and declared willful murder with no plea for mercy. What would a juryman think of Cyril Saunders' situation? As the Great War had just ended, some of them would have served in the forces. Whether they thought the accident justified his latter behaviour is a moot point. Dorothy was just 16 at the time of her death, and Cyril Saunders could have made her pregnant under the age of consent. If you contrast the British and American approach to capital punishment, is the speed in which judicial killing is carried out in the UK. Cyril Saunders cut his cousin's throat on the 23rd of September, and by the 30th of November, he was a corpse. In America, you can be on death row for years as your case trundles through the appeal system. Part of the reason is the political nature of the United States, which is a federal system. But the USA, like the UK, the question of capital punishment is a horrible lottery. In Texas, you can go to the electric chair, but it is life imprisonment in Vermont. If you would like to know more about our other true crime West Country vintage murders or catch up on all our previous episodes from the series, please visit our website vintagemurders.uk or our YouTube channel 